Good day, everyone. Randy Franklin Smith here, and today we're talking about auditing the cloud, in particular the Office 365 cloud and what they refer to as the unified audit log. So, Logarithm uh, are the uh, folks that we want to thank for making today's real training for free possible. Uh, Logarithm sponsors a lot of these awesome training topics and uh, today I have with me their Office 365 expert. He may not really like being referred to as that because I know he's been through the ringer with getting Office 365 auditing working, but let me introduce you uh, to Bruce and uh, Bruce, thanks for making uh, today's uh, real training for free possible. Yeah, thanks for having me, Randy. Uh, let's see here. So we'll get started off at the top and just uh, discuss number one, uh, which applications in Office 365 do you have the capability of auditing? And then you know, what can we audit inside those apps? Um, it comes down to basically three areas of activity, and that is administrative or privileged user access. What are your admins doing inside of Office 365? Uh, what are your end users doing in terms of what information are they accessing and sharing and looking at and changing? And then third, um, there's also some authentication and uh, logon activity uh, that we can get from the unified audit log. So next we will look at what does it take to turn this on and then how do we get this audit data out? And uh, I'll show you both the uh, portal where you can search interactively. I'll show you a PowerShell command uh, called Search Unified Audit Log. And then we'll talk about the Management Activity API and how to get this information into your SIM. And that's especially where Bruce comes in. Uh, Logarithm is putting a big investment into getting this data out of Office 365 and into they're normalized, classif uh, class yeah, classified, not in the uh, uh, government sense, Bruce, but you have a, uh, um, a common, oh, what do you call it? Uh, anyway. Yeah, we got our, our set of um, classifications, common events, and a um, couple dozen other metadata fields that are standardized between multiple log sources. Uh, so I'll show that in my demo and how you can not only leverage the Office 365 data, but other data that you've pulled in from various log sources um, that can be correlated together through these common metadata fields. Yeah, I, and it's just so powerful because then what it means is once you have an event in Logarithm, if it's a logon event, it's a logon event whether it came from Office 365 or your Cisco router, right? So good stuff coming. And yes, today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll automatically send out a link to that. So let's get started. Here's uh, the current list of applications you can audit in Office 365. Number one, Azure AD. Uh, then you also get SharePoint, which includes OneDrive for Business, uh, for the two or three of you using it. No, just kidding. Um, Exchange Online. Uh, Sway. Also, any of your eDiscovery activities, the searches that you uh, do for eDiscovery, those get audited. Now um, they are auditing what users do in uh, Power BI as well as Yammer. Now, let's talk about the top three there. So here is the typical environment of an organization uh, using Office 365. Whether you realize it or not, you're also using Azure Active Directory. Now, whether you're using other Azure services like, you know, VMs and cloud storage and uh, all the other exotic cloud services that Azure offers doesn't really play into it because the activities in there don't come into the unified audit log. So if you uh, provision a VM or stand up uh, a storage account. Okay, that that's not coming in here to the unified audit log. But what you do as far as 
users and groups and stuff like that in uh, Azure Active Directory, yeah, that is part of uh, the Office 365 Unified Audit Log. So when you create a user account in Office 365, just want to make sure everyone understands, you're not, you're not, there's no such thing really as an Office 365 user account. It's an Azure Active Directory user account. And most organizations, I would, I would say most organizations are syncing between their uh, on-premise Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. It used to be with DirSync, now it's with, uh, I think it's called AD Connect or Azure AD Connect. We'll, we'll look at that in a coming slide. Um, and then, of course, all of these different applications in Office 365, whether it's um, Exchange or SharePoint or OneDrive or Yammer or stuff like that, that, that activity. That's what we're talking about in today's uh, webinar. All of that goes into the Unified Audit Log. So in Azure AD, we've got user account maintenance. We've got uh, group maintenance. Also, you can delegate admin authority in Active Directory. That is in Azure Active Directory. So just like in, uh, in on-prem AD, you can like delegate authority over a given organizational unit or give uh, the help desk reset password authority over user accounts, that sort of thing, delegation. All right, you've got the same capability in, uh, well, a similar capability that is in Azure Active Directory. And when you do that, um, a, an audit trail is uh, produced, which is good and proper. Now, some of the other stuff that gets audited in uh, Azure AD has to do with the, the cloudy aspect of um, this, this, uh, this flavor of act, Active Directory. So uh, one of the things that we do is we, we like to integrate other applications, maybe not even from Microsoft, to rely on Active Directory. For instance, at our uh, organization, uh, our uh, Dropbox for Business account uses Active Directory for authentication. So when we log on, when we access Dropbox, we're actually logging on with our Azure AD account. So that is another thing that's audited. And that's good because you certainly want to have an audit trail if you suddenly uh, integrate another application and make it dependent upon AD. Likewise, um, the DNS domains that your Azure AD is connected with um, partners, do you have consultants that you are uh, uh, granting access to uh, your Azure AD? Uh, that, that would be audited here as well. Stuff you're doing in terms of federation, if you change uh, logon policies in Azure AD, you know, for instance, you can control password requirements just like you can with on-prem AD. All of this stuff also uh, is uh, audited and you'll find it in the um, Unified Audit Log. Uh, Mike has a question. Azure AD can be used to drive authentication for Dropbox for Business? Mike, yes, the answer is absolutely. Uh, there's something like 150 other applications uh, that have got integration either facilitated by that vendor or by, uh, by Microsoft. So yeah, you can tie a lot of stuff in. To Azure AD, and so it, you know, it's it's a nice model in terms of you probably already have an on-prem AD. Once you start synchronizing up to the cloud, up to Azure AD, why then you can pretty easily connect to lots of other applications out there. Um, now there's third-party software that makes it even easier, but it's there's good support right out of the box for quite a few. Uh, applications, and there, there's there's nothing to do but basically turn it on and uh, copy and paste a couple keys. But of course, that's not the focus of what we're talking about today. Although you know, it is important then to point out that once you connect up to stuff like Dropbox, why then um, you will get a little more in your 
audit log because Azure AD does monitor or does audit uh, log on events. And so now, you know, the more you tie in via federation to the same uh, directory, then the more centralization you have, not just over policy, but also over your monitoring. Uh, let's see here. So, John, I'm, I'm not sure on your question there. I, I don't keep up too well with what's in Azure Basic or the, uh, the free version, the so-called free version of Azure AD. Uh, let's see here. But moving on, let's leave Azure AD for a minute and let's now talk about Exchange Online. So if you're familiar with what you can audit in Exchange On-Premise, then you have a pretty good idea of what you can audit with uh, the Office 365 Unified Audit Log. So let's start with privileged users. For compliance and just for good security, we need to have an audit trail of what administrators are doing. This is a deterrent slash detective control over admins, but it's also very important for uh, being able to detect when uh, admin accounts are taken over. So here in Exchange Online, just like with Exchange On-Prem, anything that an administrator does is ultimately resolved down to a PowerShell command. So any kind of administration, whether you do it through a GUI or whether you do it through the uh, Exchange Administrative Center, the web-based portal, um, at the end of the day, it's a PowerShell command that's being run. And that's the basis for the auditing here. Um, when we look at the uh, admin audit log, it's basically a record of all of the non-read-only um, PowerShell commands that were executed with their parameters and everything else, who did it, and so on. And it works great. So if you've attended any of my webinars on uh, Exchange Auditing, then you basically have the same capabilities here with Exchange Online. Uh, let's see here. And keep an eye on these questions. I'll come back and get all of these answered. I might hold off on a couple of them for right now. Uh, let's see here. Now, what about end user access in Exchange? Well, we have to begin with the very same events that you have with Exchange on-prem. So what this is mostly for is for uh, having an audit trail of non-owner access to uh, other people's mailboxes. So who's looking at the CEO's mailbox? That is uh, one of the most, or other C-level people. That is the most frequent use case that people come to me where the uh, exchange mailbox audit log comes into play. Uh, and so that's, that's there. It's uh, a matter of auditing this message right here, folder bind. There's also one called message bind, but unfortunately it doesn't get audited as much. So the one that you really can look for is folder bind. And that tells you whenever a given user looks at a specified folder in somebody else's mailbox. Now this also gets logged uh, incidentally if uh, when a user uh, adds somebody else's mailbox to their Outlook installation, then whenever Outlook synchronizes, you're going to see that information, the, the same thing. But it doesn't mean that the user consciously went over there and looked at the data in that folder. It's just a matter of their Outlook synchronizing to it. So uh, that, that's just something to be aware of. But the other thing we do get is uh, some message tracking capability. Um, for instance, as I'll show you, I, I just realized that uh, Exchange Online is also auditing whatever I create stuff in my own mailbox. But I think that's because I've turned on all auditing, even for ownership. So it's not really message tracking. It's still mailbox audit events. Um, it's uh, just a matter of 
do you turn have you turned on auditing for the actual owner of course that's going to create a lot more information right okay uh, so I'll come back and I'm going to show you some examples of these events but right now I just want to give you a uh, an introduction to all the applications and the type of activity that's captured. So we'll come back to Exchange. Let's though talk about SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. So how many of you are familiar with SharePoint on-prem auditing? So the SharePoint on-premise audit log. Well, if you are familiar with it, and this is the SharePoint on-prem audit log, then forget what you know because there's nothing in common uh, with that. So, you know, whereas the Exchange audit logs are very similar in Office 365, in uh, SharePoint they're completely different. And it's a good thing because the raw audit log of Exchange on-prem actually was not useful. Uh, there was just all of the really important data fields were just codes that you had no way to translate. And so that's good that they didn't use that approach with uh, SharePoint Online. Um, now, before we even talk about what you can audit in there, it's important to know that OneDrive for Business is essentially SharePoint Online. And so the audit log that you have for SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business, this has nothing to do with OneDrive, the consumer version, Auto log is basically the same. Um, you do have the ability to track um, every operation on files. So every access, every download, when a file is checked in, checked out, uh, you know, copy it, whatever. Even if you, you create sharing links, so you know how you can take something in OneDrive or Dropbox and make a link and, and email that link to people? That gets audited. Um, and in terms of SharePoint itself, there's some administrative activity that gets audited as well, such as if you add a new admin to a site collection. Or, you know, SharePoint has its own groups that are, uh, you know, local to SharePoint, have nothing to do with Active Directory groups. So you can audit, uh, for instance, membership changes on those groups. That's important because that's going to be, uh, you know, that's, that's representative of uh, granting access to, to SharePoint data. Like I said, we'll show you real examples of this data here in a second. Now, um, those are the three applications that I'm going to talk about today. How do you turn this on? Before you can even start getting this data, the very first thing you have to do is find this link. And if you've already turned it on, the link won't be there. Once you turn it on, the link goes away. But it's uh, here, it's in, in fact, let me take you there. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to bring up my... Uh, there we go. Here we go. So if we come to audit log search, I'm, in fact, where am I actually? I'm here in Office 365 under admin, and then uh, we get to log back in. Okay, and then here under security and compliance, Bruce, I love the blinding speed of Office 365. Let's see here. Am I? Yeah, I'm logged into the right place. This 
is not exactly what I'm looking for, folks. Admin centers, there we go. Security and compliance. And search and investigation, audit log search. Okay, so if this were a new tenant where we had not turned on auditing, that's where we'd find that link that I was referring to uh, earlier. And uh, you've got to turn that on and then it's not instantaneous. It's going to be a, maybe a good 24 hours before you really start seeing data come in. And that, by the way, is a real factor here. Uh, Bruce, interested in your thoughts on it as well, but that's a real factor is latency here. Um, if you're accustomed to like the uh, Windows security log where, I mean, it's by the by the time you go look in the security log after you perform an event, the data is there. But it doesn't work that way with the unified audit log, does it, Bruce? It doesn't. You know, sometimes data is there right away. I've seen delays up to three, six hours for some events coming in. Um, you know, sign-ons, um, failed logins, and the timestamps are all correct, but it just won't be available through the audit log search or the API search for you know, some indeterminate time period. Right. Something you hear Microsoft people saying is, well, remember, this is the cloud. So I think you're going to see the, that, you're going to hear that term used as uh, uh, a justification for lots of things. And one of them is the latency in uh, audit logs. But here we are in the uh, audit log search. I've turned it on. Now, is that all we have to do? Uh, there's a little more to it than that, um, as I'll show you here uh, in a second. Um, let's see here, if I can get back to my slides. So once we've turned that on, we will start getting, um, there's nothing else to enable in order to get auditing from like Azure AD. It's, a, it's an all or nothing thing. It's, it's going to audit everything for Azure AD uh, and the same way for SharePoint online and OneDrive for business. It's, once you flip that switch in the portal, you're auditing everything. You don't need to go to individual. Um, that's another big difference, by the way, with between SharePoint on-prem auditing and SharePoint online auditing. With SharePoint on-prem auditing, you have to go to each site collection and turn on auditing, whereas uh, with uh, the cloud, it's just, a, it's just a switch. Turn it on for your Office 365 tenant, and now everything, every action to every document in OneDrive for Business or SharePoint Online will get audited. And um, with Exchange, though, it's a little bit different. Um, you have to go into PowerShell and turn on auditing both of the admin audit log. That's with this command right here the set admin audit log config command. And then for mailbox auditing, uh, for each and every mailbox, you've got to run the set mailbox command and then specify the audit delegate the, and the audit admin. The other one you want to make sure is that you've turned on auditing for admin level activities. And this is just like uh, Exchange on-prem. And of course, you want to make sure that Audit Enabled is turned on. Uh, how do you get a PowerShell um, session on Office 365? Just do a search um, to see the, uh, um, the way to do it. But it's pretty easy. The, the very first thing you've got to do is uh, set your execution policy. Then you've got to create a credential. So when you run that command right there, it's going to pop up a dialog, and you'll enter in your username and password. It gets stored in this little variable called $UC. And then you say, OK, I want to open up a new PowerShell session. And it's going to be connected to Outlook.Office360. Uh, 
5 PowerShell. So what you're telling it is, hey, connect this PowerShell session to Office 365, and here's my user credential. And then it, uh, it connects up. Then the final thing that you need to do is uh, tell it to import the session. Yeah, right here. Import PowerShell session. Once you do that, now it's as though you are, well, you are. You're running a PowerShell session, command prompt, on um, the Office 365 environment with access to your tenant. So then you can, uh, that's at, at the point at which you can configure auditing for your admin audit log. So for instance, the command that you see right here is saying uh, enable the admin audit log and I want to audit all commandlets and all parameters. Now if you want more information on the admin audit log and all the stuff that you can uh, track, just go to my website, ultimatewindowssecurity.com, and I've got an entire section devoted to exchange auditing both the admin audit log and the mailbox audit log. And it's all, um, the nice thing is, as far as Exchange Online is concerned, it's, it's all basically the same as Exchange On-Prem. Okay, so this is, whoops, come on eraser, thank you. So this is also where we um, would turn on mailbox auditing. And remember, the big thing there is you've got to turn it on for each and every mailbox, one at a time. There's no way to set a uh, global audit policy for all mailboxes. So this is convenient if there's just a few mailboxes that you want to audit. You know, it's simply a matter of turning it on for them. You can leave it turned off for all the rest. On the other hand, if it's everybody, then you're going to have to look at uh, some kind of scripting capability. Okay, so once we've done that, uh, auditing is coming in. We let a day go by to where events are really pouring in. How do we get at those logs? Well, the place you'll probably start is with the, um, uh, the portal. Bear with me here. I... There we go. And here's the portal. And so we can select which actions we want to audit. Now, one of the first ones that I start off with, just because I'm asked about it so much, is being able to see who is looking at the CEO's mailbox. Now, interestingly, that one uh, is not directly addressed by your options here. If we come down to Exchange Mailbox Activities, notice that there's nothing in here for uh, users accessing somebody else's mailbox or viewing the mailbox. Now, I happen to know that uh, getting, uh, that this event that we're talking about is called Folder Bind. I just, I happen to know that by virtue of uh, Exchange on prem auditing. So instead, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, see if we can just search on that. And I'm starting with this tough example because I want to show you, I want to make sure you understand that there's real limitations here with the portal. Um, Office 365 is nowadays doing a good job with generating the audit trail, but getting the data out, even for casual searching, is not that easy. Um, now, I happen to know that Patrick was looking at my mailbox, and that's okay. He's allowed to. So let's search on him. We'll bring some uh, events in. And then, now I start to get some folder bind events. But the problem is, what if we're just trying to find out, has anybody looked at Randy's mailbox? There's no good way to do that. Here's what the event looks like, by the way. So this is telling us that Patrick 
performed a folder bind operation. Um, it was done with Outlook. Folder bind means viewed um, a folder in exchange in an exchange mailbox. What folder was it? It was um, the permanent subfolder, the, the subfolder under inbox called permanent. And um, whose mailbox was it? Randy's. Okay, so that's what the event's telling you. But what if we didn't know it was Patrick that had done that? And that's, Bruce, that's the whole point of this, right, is who was looking at the uh, CEO's mailbox and, and leaked that information to the press. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And uh, it's kind of surprising that you can't search that from the portal. Um, now, I think I'll show later on within Logarithm how you can do that. Um, is that possible to do from the search commandlet? Um, it's a little bit easier there because you've got some other filtering capability. I, I'll come in and talk about the search commandlet here in a second. Um, but here's other stuff that we can audit on. It's pretty easy. You know, we could say, um, I want to see uh, who was it that accessed such and such file. And we'll take Patrick off of there. And we could put the name of the file in um, and then search that way. But I don't even remember any files that we've uh, been auditing here. Here we go. So yeah, um, accessed file. And then we get the name of the file. Uh, these are all reports from my uh, Rosetta library. And uh, there you go. If we were trying to look for a particular um, file, who's been looking at that data, we could put that in. So any file name with permission in it. And there we go. So it's pretty cool. Um, as you can see, the data is really there. It's being audited. Um, it's just a matter of getting it out. So I think everybody, in fact, people are already asking me, I don't want to, you know, here in the webinar, I don't want to go to the portal. I, I need this information in my SIM, and, and you're short-circuiting me. That's what this is all about. I totally uh, agree. So how do you get that data out to the SIM? Well, first of all, uh, my point is that using the portal, by the way, you can, there is a, a, uh, an export capability here uh, on the portal, too. So you can export what I call bits and pieces of the uh, audit log, but not the whole thing. That's the unfortunate part uh, from uh, uh, from the portal. So then that takes us to PowerShell because the problem with the portal is number one, leaving the audit data inside of Office 365 breaks the first law of uh, audit log management, right Bruce? You, you cannot leave audit logs on the system where they're generated because that means they're vulnerable to tampering either by the privileged users and the only control we have over privileged users is the audit log. That is the only, you know, the audit log is your only deterrent slash detective control over privileged users. So we have to get the audit log off the system where it's generated. But also, of course, bad guys, one of the first things they do is they're going to erase the audit log to cover up their tracks and complicate your uh, forensics capability. So we've got to get that those audit logs out. Plus, it's not archived long enough. I, I think the limit is 90 days. Uh, I think AV stuff may be kept around a little bit longer, but in general, uh, audit data is only kept in uh, ex, uh, Office 365 for 90 days, and Microsoft himself says, you know, you need to get this audit data out. So, can we use this PowerShell command? Search-unified-audit-log. Well, let's take a look at it. So if I run the command without you know, any criteria at all, you can see the kind of data we get. Um, you're going to have a record type 
that tells you where the um, uh, audit event came from. Did it come from Azure AD? Did it come from Exchange? Did it come from SharePoint? Or so on. Of course, you get the event and you get the user ID that is associated with performing that event. Okay, then you get the operation. And that's, that's like where you would find the word folder bind. Uh, and uh, so here we're looking at a mailbox login and then all the other information, which that, see, this, the, this can vary. A lot of the fields can vary depending upon the type of event. Because remember, what we're getting here is every action, whether it's creating a user account in Azure AD, looking at a file in uh, OneDrive, or doing something in Yammer, or creating a, a, a dashboard in Power BI. So all of that is um, in here in uh, JSON format in the audit data field. Uh, so like uh, what's something interesting here? We would have a mailbox login. Is there anything interesting on that particular? Oh, yeah. I think IP that's some, somebody signed in. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I was going to say that's just a, a sign-in event. So. Uh, probably not super interesting from first look, but if you're going back and auditing uh, if somebody was signed in from where they're not supposed to be signed in, then it gets really interesting. Yeah, yeah, so there, you know, we get the IP address, that would be interesting in that event. Here's an Azure Active Directory account login, so this is the initial uh, authentication to Azure Active Directory. You're not going to see this event if you remain logged in in the same browser and access other stuff. Um, and that's why you see these two different login events. Logging on to Exchange, your Exchange mailbox is one thing. Um, you may do that many times a day, but probably you're only going to have to log into Azure AD uh, maybe once a day, depending upon how your federation and policies are set up. Um, okay, but here's the thing. I'm limited to, and this is unclear, I mean just check out the documentation on this page, it drives me absolutely nuts. I'm definitely going to have to do for the uh, Office 365 audit log what I did for the uh, Windows security log, and that is get in there and really test all of this out. But the bottom line is, that I'm leading up to, is you're limited to how many records this uh, PowerShell command will return. Now, um, there is the way to specify a session ID and run multiple instances of this PowerShell command to basically get like pages of data, but even that has an upward limit, and it's unclear what that limit is. Just on this one page, there's three different numbers bandied about. Um, it says results are limited to 10,000 records, not 50,000. <laughs> Doesn't that strike you as kind of weird? That, I mean, we could also put not 51,000 and, and not 62,383 either, uh, Bruce. I mean, there's a lot of other numbers besides 10,000. Yeah, there's definitely some inconsistencies across their documentation that we've run across throughout this whole process of getting O365 pulled into logarithm. Um, but then down here, when it talks about result size, uh, it says um, the maximum is 5,000. So I don't know if it's 10,000, 5,000, but I know it's not 50,000 because they say it's not. Um, the bottom line is, though, in uh, an organization of any size, Bruce, you're going to have a lot more events than 10,000, especially given that this is all or nothing. You turn it on and everything gets audited. You know, every access to every file in everyone's OneDrive, for instance, um, or nothing at all. So we're talking about lots of events. And there's just no way with either the portal or the, uh, this command here, the search mailbox, auto, uh, sorry, search unified audit log to get all of the data out, to just get your entire audit log. And it makes sense though, because it would, maybe it'd be unfair to expect that, because this command is called search. It's not called export entire mailbox audit log. So 
definitely that's going to be an issue. And what it leaves then is, so I'm going to X this out because of uh, max results limit. That leaves the Office 365 Management Activity API. So to do that, you've got to um, uh, program against the uh, so-called RESTful uh, API to get that data. And that is what uh, you folks have done, Bruce. Um, you've actually gone down to that level and done the programming, and that is the only way you can get your entire audit log out of Office 365. And that's what we're going to show you here in a second. And then I'm going to come back and uh, answer some of these questions that you folks have been uh, posing about different, uh, different uh, areas of this audit capability. The bottom line, though, is Office 365 does a great job on this, producing the audit trail. So you definitely can tell what's happening in the cloud, and that's great. That is the most important thing. Uh, but it's up to you to fulfill the remaining compliance regulations and security requirements, such as, number one, securing it from privileged users and intruders, uh, getting long-term archival, actually monitoring it and alerting when there's stuff that's uh, important to follow up on, and then finally, correlation with the rest of your organization's activity. Otherwise, what you have is called a silo. So break down the silo for us, Bruce. Show us what uh, you can do, and then uh, we'll come back and answer these questions and any that folks have for you. I'm going to make you the presenter. All right, sounds great. So like Randy said, we did onboard to the Office 365 Management Activity API, and we can pull all those logs into Logarithm. Uh, I'm not going to lie, this is one of the more difficult APIs to set up. Um, Microsoft has uh, a couple limitations there. You have to create an app in Azure AD. You have to have a certificate, you know, maybe self-signed. Um, but then you have to upload that cert to Azure AD. Um, it's really and sometimes Quite an involved you've got to open up a, sorry to interrupt, but sometimes you have to open up a support case to get them to turn it on. Even though you've turned on the management API, it's not, there's some little switch they have to go flip in a closet before you actually start getting the events. Yeah, and we're trying to get that better documented on our side of what you would see if that's the case, because uh, there are a lot of these edge cases that we're running into. Uh, I will say, once you start pulling that data in, uh, it's great to have in the O365 environment, and that's what I'm going to demo today. Um, so I just want to make sure that, Randy, you can see my dashboard coming through clearly. Yep, you look good. Wonderful. Uh, so before I start the demo, uh, I'll do a quick intro on myself. I'm a technical product manager from Logarithm, which means I'm embedded in the development team, but I work closely with customers and partners to answer our question, you know, what are we going to ship next? My areas are... CoreSem, which is basically log processing, and then threat intelligence and cloud log collection, which is why I'm here today. Uh, in a former life, I did a stint at Microsoft working on an O365 product, Skype for Business. Uh, so this is a cool opportunity to kind of come full circle with all the areas I've gotten to work in over the past couple of years. Uh, now, talk a little bit about SEMs in general. Uh, so if you're here for a webinar on O365, you've probably moved to the cloud or you're considering moving to the cloud. Uh, and what we found is often that the IT department and CISO have different priorities in an organization. You know, it's the cloud, it's cheaper, it's easier. So IT said, okay, you know, let's move all of our O365 services to the cloud. Um, but from a security perspective, you've lost control over a lot of that data. Um, and furthermore, you may have services like SharePoint that were locked down on your internal network. Now that you're up in the cloud, they're open to the internet if somebody gets the user credentials. Uh, so clearly you need access to those logs. And there are a lot of them. Like Randy said, um, it's very difficult to get all of them and those limits were very unclear. But to give you a concrete example on Logarithm's environment, we're a small, medium company, five to 600 people, and we generate over 10,000 Office 365 events in one day. So that's a volume that can't be managed without the right tools. Um, you're not going to be able to manage that through the O365 portal or even through the commandlet unless you build a lot of custom scripting behind that. 
Um, and furthermore, you know, Randy talked about the long-term access to your logs. Those disappear within, uh, I think, 90 days in the portal, and they're only available for seven days within the REST API. So that's why we're calling the REST API every 10 seconds saying, hey, what do you got for me? What do you got for me? Uh, and consistently pulling that data in for even longer storage of your audit logs. Um, so, you know, especially if you're not running a SEM, how long is it going to take you to discover if there was an incident? Um, and then how are you going to discover where that initial compromise was if you don't have them centralized in somewhere that, you know, even if you don't have those in live active storage, you can still have a passive storage like archiving that you're writing everything to so you can go pull that back in if it was, say, a year ago that you think there may have been some sort of compromise. Uh, all right, you're sold now. SEMs are great, uh, but let's do an actual demo to see the O365 data in action. I've had this dashboard up for a couple minutes, probably been looking at it, um, and logarithm, SEMs in general, allow you to aggregate all these log sources together to see holistic patterns throughout your environment data. Um, in this case, I'm just focusing on one source within the dashboard. I'm going to expand that out later, um, but I can audit my most critical capabilities in one place and then pivot if I need to. So, for example, I have the Office 365 classifications chart highlighted here. Uh, but these classifications aren't unique to Office 365. Take something like authentication failure that you can see is our uh, fifth most popular. That's something that uh, would show up in a Windows event log. We'll actually see that later on in the demo. Um, or if you're onboarded to something like uh, Salesforce and somebody has a couple Salesforce login failures, they come up as the same classification so that you can write a rule, or we actually have out-of-the-box rules that say, if you see a number of authentication failures, no matter what source they're from, then tell me about it. Fire an alarm. All right, so when the logs come in from O365, Logarithm processes them and pulls data out into metadata fields that Randy talked about uh, earlier. You know, we have the classification, common event, but we also have a couple dozen other metadata fields from users to hosts, IP addresses, um, senders, if you're auditing things like send on behalf of. Um, and these are rules that our Logarithm Labs department has written for probably close to 1,000 sources now. Um, so in the case of O365, you do a little bit of configuration to pull these logs in, and everything else is taken care of for you. What that means for you is consistency and correlation across all your log data. Now, you can see the dashboard, and one of the cool features of this is I can go into the grid and see the logs that are generating the correlations that you see above. So the first thing that I'm going to do uh, is the delegated events that Randy talked about earlier. So right here I got the command pinned, and I'm going to look at the folder bind because uh, that's easy to search for. And I can go to my identity tab, let's say, uh, and we have the user Steve doing something to Seth's account. Um, there's metadata here like user agent that's populated out to a, a field that could be aggregated on. And I can go into the log message itself. I can see that this was a delegated, so I can even search on delegated actions, and I would get other commands like send on behalf of. Uh, and then I can go in and see the exact folder. So Steve was looking at Seth's folder conversation history. Uh, now this may not be Steve actually looking at that, but it says that he at least had access to it and kind of leaving the audit trail in place. Uh, furthermore, you get the IP address, so maybe this isn't actually Steve, but somebody that has Steve's credentials. Hey, so uh, Bruce? Yeah. So, you know, I think right here we see the benefit of getting this data into a SIM because you could, if you, you know, normally you'd be starting with Seth. Who's been looking at Seth's mailbox? And we could do that because you're surfacing all of that here in the search. Exactly. So, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter of who you're looking at. You know, I can click on this um, Steve field, and I can get everything where Steve was the origin or impacted user, which means Steve was doing something or someone was doing something to Steve's account. 
um, and you can pivot off of that. So a lot of what we do in here is starting with something like a log and then expanding outward, and that's not something that you can do easily from the O365 portal. And even if you could, it would limit you to that siloed data. Does that kind of jive with what you've seen so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, can't, I just can't even do that basic search in Office 365 portal, even though the data is there. Uh, and other interesting events, um, something like um, account created, um, you know, sharing invitation created, will show you that this person is sharing with somebody outside of their organization. And we actually have it set up so that if it's an external account, a guest access, it has kind of a higher uh, risk-based priority in the system. So you can kind of prioritize events that, okay, you know, maybe I shared with the user inside of my organization. Um, that's not too suspicious, but sharing outside of my organization, I may want to take a look at that. Um, so that covers our dashboarding capability. Randy, I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd want to point out in here. Otherwise, I'm going to jump into the alarms. No, go for it. And then we got plenty of questions coming in, so this is fine. Great. All right. So, you know, I'm a, a SOC analyst. I come in in the morning. I say, is there anything interesting for me to look at? And I have an alarm. Uh, so this alarm comes from our advanced intelligence engine. That's a set of rules that our labs department security experts have said, these are potentially malicious or suspicious things. Uh, they have a saying, they like they say, this is suspicious, let's find out if it's malicious. Um, and you can do that with a simple drill down. You, you know, you can see that the uh, title here is brute force off. And what that actually is, is a number of uh, failed authentications. And I think I said earlier, it doesn't have to be just an O365. Now, in this example, it is. Um, but it could be somebody trying to compromise credentials uh, between Office 365, Salesforce, anywhere that they may have a single authentication. Um, now, this is kind of interesting. We have uh, 13 user failures in a pretty short time period. Um, and I'm curious now what this user was doing. Um, so I can pivot pretty quickly on the user. Um, I can see, you know, let's go 24 hours in the past and six hours in the future from when all these logs were generated. That'll queue up a new search. And now all results are in. And this user has been busy. There's a lot of activity going on here. You know, you can see um, over a thousand events generated in just over a day. Um, I'm going to add a widget live. We'll see if I can get this to go in a live demo. Uh, and it's going to be a trend widget. So I'm going to look at what this user has been doing from a classification perspective over the past 36 hours. Um, and you can see right away that there's a lot of activity right before those auth failures. Uh, I can mouse over and see the spike in auth failures right around 9 p.m. Um, but I also see a big spike in access successes, which is kind of curious. So I have a user that was potentially compromised with a brute force attack. Um, I have access successes and authentication successes around the same time. So what I can do now is go into my logs and look at classification as access successes. And I'll go in and look at anything that has the file name populated. And right away, I can see a bunch of file downloads from this user. Um, and I get the file name, which is great from an auditing perspective, because if I'm looking to respond to this, I need to know exactly what files were touched by this potentially um, malicious activity. Um, and I can go into the identity um, and see some 
you know, additional data. I can look at the IP address that these files were downloaded to. So a lot of great information coming from Office 365. Uh, so let's go back real quick and look at the authentication failures because I want to figure out what's going on with this user. So I'm going to do a filter to auth failures. And I can see a lot of log sources from the Office 365 API, but I also see on one of my hosts from an MS event log that there's a bunch of failures around this time as well. Um, now at this point, it could just be a user that forgot his password or um, you know changed their password recently. But there are some suspicious things around this host, so let's pivot on that for a second. Uh, so we'll just look at after that failed login, we'll go one hour in the future. That'll show me everything going on on that host. Uh, and if you're running Network Monitor, uh, which is one of the things we just launched a freemium on, uh, so you can download and try that out for free um, and send events to your SEM. You can see on this host, you had 130 megabytes of Dropbox traffic within an hour after those failed logons. So immediately, this just in my brain went from suspicious to malicious. Um, one of the common exfiltrations that we see is Dropbox. Uh, Network Monitor will classify that for us. So now we've gone from an alarm, we've identified a user that was potentially compromised, we've identified the files that were accessed, and we've identified that there's potential data exfiltration. So this really speaks to the core value of a SEM, which is mean time to detect and mean time to respond. Uh, we detected it quickly through the alarms, through pulling the API in, uh, and you gotta ask the question, if you weren't bringing these logs into the SEM, would you have discovered this incident at all? Uh, maybe you would have, but how long would it have taken? And now that you've discovered it, how long is it going to take you to respond to lock down this event? Uh, we already know what files were accessed and what could have been compromised, uh, but there's also capabilities within the alarms to have something called a smart response. So these are uh, packages where you can set up things like uh, automatically disable accounts or add that user to a watch list if you're just suspicious of that user, um, you know, maybe elevate their potential threat. Um, so it gives you the ability to detect and respond super quickly. Um, and I'll summarize that by saying, you know, our logs are really valuable to get from O365, but they're unmanageable without some sort of log management tool. Uh, they're just one piece to the puzzle in your environment and you can only get that holistic picture when you put the puzzle together with a SAM-like logarithm. So Randy, I'll hand it back over to you if you have anything to add uh, about the investigation, the demo, or if you want to just jump into questions. Okay, that sounds great. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let's see, Michael asked, where can I get a copy? Michael, were you talking about um, logarithm? I mean, can they uh, arrange a, a demo or an eval or what? They could. Uh, you know, you can reach out to me. Um, and Randy, if you can share out my LinkedIn profile or my email with this in case anybody has questions on the logarithm side after the fact, um, that'd be great. And they can reach out to me directly. And uh, whether it's questions on just getting O365 into their environment, if they're an existing logarithm customer, or if they aren't running a SEM completely and want a demo, uh, I can get them connected with the right people. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Donald says, does the Office 365 threat activity map come from Microsoft or Logarithm? So let me go back to that threat activity map. Um, so the dashboard in general for O365 was something that I created for the demo. Uh, it's pretty easy to just dr drag and drop widgets, um, and these things are filtered to where the log source is O365 management activity. Um, and I added the threat map, which is a widget on its own, and I filtered that down to the Office 365 uh, management activity. I also put in the message tracking. 
Um, that's one of the things that Microsoft offers through API as well that we're working on official product support, but it's pretty easy to do in PowerShell as well. So you can see where emails are coming in from, where they're going to, uh, and you get IP address information like that. So uh, this is something, to answer the question directly, um, that comes from Logarithm. Uh, that you can build out a dashboard, but I can also share out this dashboard file. Uh, it's pretty easy to export. And then if you wanted to uh, add the dashboard, all you would have to do is uh, import the dashboard file and it would come complete with the threat map, which would be populated with your data. Now here's an awesome question that demonstrates, you know, that, that gets to the, the power of a sim. Uh, Steve says, what about tying public IPs to internal private RFC 1918 IPs to figure out the internal machine or user that did the Office 365 activity? It says customers use NAT, so all Office 365 activity from the internal network will look like it came from the same um, you know, public or you know, internet NAT IP address, right? The IP address of your NAT gateway. Is there some way to map this or connect them? So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that Logarithm is awesome at, is being able to link disparate events to each other. Yeah, there's a couple ways that you can do that. Um, there's entity creation, uh, where you can, you know, map a user box to an internal IP address. Um, there's also identity inference, which might be the more appropriate one for this scenario. So. You may know the host that it's coming from, um, but you don't know who's logged in at the time. And what an identity inference does is it says, I know this user signed on to the machine at um, 10 a.m. and signed off at 10.30. They were the only one signed in at the time, and the activity's at 10.15. So I can say with reasonable confidence that it was Bruce doing this activity. That's right. There, there would be a few different ways, and, and you could definitely do it with, yeah, could, timing is going to be part of it. Um, Adam says, for those of us using Logarithm already, will you please show us the config of your Office 365 widget for the web console? Um, and some, a couple other people, maybe we can kind of knock these out at the same time. Uh, Carlton says, I didn't really catch how the data gets from Office 365 to Logarithm. Is this the API configuration process. And so if, Bruce, that's what's happening. I don't know where it runs inside a logarithm, but I know you've got a program that is, um, uh, you've already gotten the, the appropriate, um, uh, oh, what is it, it's open ID keys, what, it's not, um, no, no, you're using a certificate, but I can't remember the standard nowadays for the kind of authentication normally used with REST, but that's, you've got that token, and that's what you're using to connect to Office 365. Office 365 knows that, okay, you are such and such application that's been pre-authorized for this tenant, and then you're saying, is there any new audit data? Is there any new audit data? And then if there is, it gives you back an ID for that chunk of data. This is how the API works, and then you turn around and then ask for that chunk of data, right? And then you parse it. Right. Um... It's a pretty involved process to set up. Uh, I would say it's probably one of our most involved APIs because of what you have to do on the Microsoft side to get it going. Um, and I don't have a demo ready to be available. Um, I don't want to be showing my private keys and everything on the demo. But I am working on a blog post for this right now to talk about some best practices when you're adding it. Um, so I'll walk through verbally on the steps that need to be done uh, you start within Azure AD and you add an application. Uh, and this is the application that your agent is going to authenticate to. Um, and you'll add permissions to the application within O365 to say that, yes, you have access to my O365 management activity data. Uh, so once you've done that, you'll go into the uh, logarithm environment. And you can either generate a self-signed certificate or use one that you have already. Um, and you'll export a couple values from that certificate. Um, you have to go upload those values back into the O365 portal, which tells Microsoft that you know 
these are my cert values. You can use those to decode the token that I authenticate with. Um, from a logarithm perspective, you'll put a couple values like your application ID, um, the path to your certificate, and your certificate password into a configuration file. Uh, and then all you have to do is add the log source from the logarithm console, tell it it's an O365 log source, and point it to that configuration file. From there, the logarithm agent is going to contact O365. Uh, it's going to create a JWT token, um, and it's going to sign that token with your certificate. And since O365 has the private key of your certificate, it can decode that and say, okay, you are who you say you are. Now I can start giving you back log data. So our agent will start calling the REST API and say, I want to subscribe to events from Azure AD and Exchange and SharePoint um, and give me everything you have as it comes down. Hey, I took over for a second here just presenting to kind of give folks a feel of the Office 365 part. You have to come into actually Azure AD into your directory. Uh, in my case, it's monterreytechgroup.com. And then you go to Enterprise Applications. And um, this is where I set up my unified audit log research. Basically, you know, it would be telling them I've got logarithm and there's other information that you have to provide, including those keys that you were talking about. But that's that's what you're talking about on the Office 365 part, right? Yeah, exactly. Creating that application and making sure the right permissions are on it. Yeah. Um, it needs an application ID, and there's somewhere where you actually give it the permission and tell it what it can do. But um, it changes every week, so it looks different than the last time I came in. <laughs> um, you may need, so if you scroll back over to the right, uh, there's a couple places you can do this from. You have to go to App Registrations. So the, uh, and then you go to your application. So the Enterprise application will give you kind of, I want to call it read-only access, or you can search audit logs from the application. But when you go into the registered applications, that's where you can do your setup on required permissions. Uh, and yeah, like you said, it does change every week. They are in the process of switching over their portal from the old version to the new version. And I'm still working on uh, figuring out exactly what moved where. Um, but I'll have plenty of screenshots included in the blog post. Uh, I will say all of Microsoft's documentation still has screenshots from the old portal. So that's where it can get a little confusing. And But there it is. There's the Office 365 Management API permission, where you give your application access to that. Yeah, and I think there's only four of them. Uh, there's seven permissions total in there, and they've deprecated three of them. OK. Uh, and they do go into detail in their documentation on the exact permissions you need. Okay, but what that is all about is simply authorizing an application uh, to connect, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, to connect via the REST uh, standards, not really protocol, to Office 365 and get this data out. Now, you still have to do all the programming against that REST API, and that, that REST API is documented uh, in MSDN. Okay. It is, mostly. Yeah, well, I didn't say documented well. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Let's see here. Um, uh, Tommy asks one of those unanswerable questions. How much storage space will I need to store these audit logs? But of course, that all depends upon how many users you have, what their activity is, and then what SIM do you have? Because every SIM stores this stuff differently, but um, you know, this is very highly textual information with a lot of redundant um, bytes in it. So I imagine you guys do some kind of compression? We do, and there's actually a couple places that you can send and store. So when our labs department is putting together the rules for what to parse out, they decide, hey, this is probably an important event. You know, let's say a uh, file share, maybe with an external user, um, something where you're doing delegated access, um, whereas a sign-in probably wouldn't be as critical. 
So we take the critical ones and we send them to our events database, and our events live longer than the rest of the storage, uh, and you can do a little bit more with them. Um, everything goes into archives, so that's, you know, maybe you put it on tape or long-term storage, so that if you do go past your time to live, then uh, you'll pull those in through something we call second look, and you can say, all right, give me everything from 0365 from the past year, um, and it'll put that into a special repository that you can then use to search against. Um, so uh, to summarize that, we have critical events with a longer TTL and some less critical events with a shorter TTL that go into our elastic search. So Enzo wants to know, is there a way to audit when people are forwarding email? And um, I'm not aware of any event that actually catches that you forwarded an email. There are events for catching when you create an email if you've turned on auditing of owner access to their mailbox. And of course that's going to generate a lot of activity because it's going to track everything that a user does inside their own mailbox. But there's the answer to you on that. Enzo, probably a hacker, you're talking about an attacker forwarding uh, email. Oh, I see. Enzo is saying, what if we set up a forwarding rule, like with PowerShell? Yes, that is absolutely auditable with and it's not the mailbox audit log, it's the admin audit log inside of Exchange. So yeah, that little command that I gave you earlier would uh, turn on auditing of that. You just need to figure out what PowerShell command you're talking about. Um, Dale asks, are there default signatures to identify something like password spraying as well as brute force against one account? And yeah, you guys are all over that with your knowledge engineering team, right? We are, and that's one of the uh, goals of Advanced Intelligence Engine, uh, to pull together a lot of these um, potentially suspicious events. So uh, it'll look for things like, um, you know, authentication failures uh, across a variety of log sources. Um, one of the interesting rules that um, I should have enabled for this, because that would have made a a better alarm than the one I had enabled was where you have a number of authentication failures followed by an authentication success. And it's such a simple scenario, but it also gives you more context when you're looking at it to say, oh, somebody might have been brute forcing and it looks like they got in. Uh, but that's grouped by a source IP, so that would be one person coming in. We also have another rule that's looking for distributed brute force. So you know, potentially somebody hitting it from a number of different endpoints that we can detect um, and fire with a different rule that gives you even more context of what might be going on. That's cool. Um, uh, let's see here. Good question here from Simon. He says, what sort of bandwidth is the system monitor, system monitor agent using when pulling down Office 365 data? Um, have you looked at, I mean, the biggest thing to consider is the the polling, and that's really just like every 10 seconds asking for a small web page, really, is all you're doing. Right. So it's, it's not really a significant amount of bandwidth. Uh, I think it would be mostly from the audit logs. And if you were concerned about a single agent doing a lot of bandwidth, you can actually split that up into one of the agents auditing um, Azure Active Directory, one of them auditing Exchange, one of them auditing SharePoint, um, especially for a larger organization that may have, um, you know, a 10, 20 events every couple seconds um, or more, you know, 100 events, especially if you have a, a 10,000 person organization where folks are signing in. Yeah. Um... You know, I don't have any hard numbers for you because it does depend on the size of the organization. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, Donald asks, is there any way, like with IP address ranges or domains, to determine uh, line of business or departments in your search? Uh, well, you do connect up to Active Directory, right? You you do import information from AD. This isn't necessarily, I don't think this question really necessarily has to do with Office 365. It's just when you're looking at events, um, can we can we start adding filters or rules and say, well, if it's the sales department, this, but if it's 
engineering that, you know? You can. You can do the Active Directory sync that'll pull people down, you know, based off of security group, and then you can search against uh, security group. You know, you could pull certain users into a logarithm list, um, and if you wanted to, I think I mentioned earlier, a, a list of highly suspicious users, you could have one alarm that fires and says, this is something that's suspicious. Let me automatically add that user to a list, and then uh, have another rule that says, if you see activity and the user is on a suspicious list, then elevate the priority of that alarm. So there's a, a couple different scenarios there, you know, whether you're searching by department or trying to do something more dynamically, uh, it's all possible. James asks, can Logarithm play with other cloud providers? Seems like we would need visibility into any cloud provider. AD or, I, you know, I would say any cloud provider that has important information um, you need to audit. So I imagine that's something you guys are working on. Like, for instance, Dropbox and Box, they both have audit logs as well. Right. We do have Box audit logs. We're working on Dropbox. Um, AWS is another common one where folks will have the whole infrastructure hosted in AWS and we can get all those logs back down. You know, they have a number of services like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, S3. Um, so all those logs are important to your environment and we can pull them in. Um, and as long as your users are named um, appropriately, you know, most of, the, most of the time you're probably thinking Active Directory anyway. So then you get everybody in the same place. So you can see Bruce is doing activity in Exchange Online and over in AWS and over in Box. Now, Adrian, a while back, asked me, do the audit logs include Exchange Online, DLP, Data Loss Prevention? And uh, no, I don't think they do, Adrian. I'm not um, very familiar with uh, the DLP stuff in uh, Exchange Online, but I can tell you that I've never seen any events pertaining to it in the unified audit log. Um, Matt so, asks, is there a legitimate I, reason for a, a copy mailbox command to execute? Seems like this would be a major red flag. And so, I mean, that's an example of totally what you could do is um, export and copy mailbox. I mean, those are very um, specific uh, PowerShell commands. So I imagine that that gets already gets put in a some kind of standard operation or action field in logarithm and so yeah it'd be simple to do that. I'm going to jump back to the DLP real quick because uh, on your screen you're showing permissions and one of them is read DLP policy events including detected sensitive, sensitive data. Oh, yeah, um, okay. However that's one of the ones that Microsoft said were deprecated so it sounds like they wanted to do that and then they decided they weren't going to do that through the management APIs, so they removed it. Um, and the next time I talk to the Microsoft folks, I will ask them about that, because I'm kind of curious what their roadmap is around DLP and exposing that through API. Cool. Um, Bruce, let me make you the presenter again in case anything comes up that we want to show. Uh, and let's see here. My next question. Um, Donald says, compared with Amazon AWS and their SNS, Simple Notification Service, there definitely is a latency with Microsoft. So, um, yeah, now, the, technically, the, uh, Donald, the Management Activity API does support the idea of a webhook, where they will reach out to you via REST and tell you immediately when new audit data is available. But that doesn't change the fact that that audit data is available on a delay of anywhere from, uh, you know, a few minutes to much, much, much longer. I think uh, I think they're trying to get stuff down to two hours, but there's still some stuff that's um, uh, subject to much longer delays than two hours, maybe even 24 hours. Um, he's saying, I don't think uh, latency should be an excuse with cloud. I, I would agree with you. I mean, it's the fact of the matter is there's a lot that you give up when you go to the uh, the public cloud. But, you know, at the same time, there's a lot that you get, and um, it, it all depends on whether what you're giving up and what you're getting are, are which ones are the most important. Um, but definitely in terms of security and control and just latency, uh, 
the cloud takes longer. Like I'm amazed, Bruce, I don't know about you, about how long it just takes to, to spin up a virtual machine. Um, I, you know, there's no way I could switch over to using the cloud for my test environment because when I get ready to do some testing, I, I want the VM up in a minute, not 15 minutes. Is that Azure or AWS that you're using? Well, that's Azure. Is a what's AWS like? Uh, I don't have much experience with either. I oh, okay. tend to do most of my stuff locally as well. Yeah. Uh, let's see here, M Michelle. Are there additional costs to enabling auditing in Office 365 for storage? And what is the default retention and maximum amount of time of retention? So, Michelle, I think I answered that about the retention. It's 90 days. There's no um, charges for storing that audit data inside of Office 365, although um, I did point out that, that you would fail uh, any, um, any well-executed audit uh, or, or compliance uh, assessment if you're keeping your audit data on the same system where it's generated. You've got to get that out because in, a, in any medium or larger size organization, your security folks are going to own the SIM and the storage that SIM uses as opposed to all the other operational admins that, that own the systems that you're auditing. You, you know the separation of duty that I'm talking about there, Bruce? I do. Um, and, you know, in terms of that, it, it, is, um, it, it does vary by organization as to who owns what, uh, but typically in an organization that's under compliance constraints, uh, they have um, certain things that uh, need to be in place uh, and, you know, logarithm is common criteria certified um, and we do have a number of compliance reports out of the box. So if you are pulling in for compliance reasons, um, we can support that and all the reports that are necessary. Uh, let's see here. Mickey asks, is there an option for offloading the same audit logging to a SIM? And so that is very dependent upon the SIM, and you've seen today what logarithm uh, has done. Let's see here. Michelle asks, uh, in Autolog search, can a group name be typed in instead of users? No. Um, it's not going to say, did a member of this group, it's not going to support being able to ask in the portal, did a member of this group do this or do that? Uh, Donald, what permissions or logging on the audit log are available? So what file permissions? So Donald, are you saying, can I audit changes to file permissions, or are you asking what permissions are needed to look at the audit log? Um, Dale asks, how is the export of audit logs affected by the delay in the log data being present in Azure that Bruce mentioned? So. It's just a matter of asking for the audit data, and as soon as you see it, you get it, right, Bruce? Right, and we'll pull out the timestamp from the log itself. So, you know, we'll be asking for the latest logs. Microsoft will give us logs. They may be four hours old at that point, um, but it'll include a timestamp in there that says this log is from 6 in the morning, even though we're getting it at 11 in the afternoon, uh, and we'll use that as our timestamp within the system. So you can still correlate that with other events that happened around the same time. Uh, you may just not get it when you want it. Yeah, or as soon as you want it. Uh, let's see here. Mike asks, can filters be applied to Office 365 activity? No, it's, it's an all or nothing. Office 365 is going to generate all these events. And like many log sources, it really becomes a function, a matter of your SIM filtering out the noise. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, Simon asks, is the web console you're showing, that dashboard, is that available from logarithm support or it's something that will be available soon, I guess? So the web console in general is available for logarithm. I am on the 7.2 version, which we'll be releasing within the next couple of weeks. Um, and that gives me the ability to do a couple of these new widgets. Um, I think that the trend, um, but yes, in general, um, with any 
6371 or 72 version of logarithm, you have the web console. Um, Sammy, what are the possibilities of storing the logs, log files besides Azure? So I, I, they're not necessarily stored in Azure, they're just in Office 365 and that's it. Unless you have something like Logarithm that will use the Management Activity API to get the data out, that's all you got. Um, James says, so does this latency mess with the AIE rules that say event B happens within one hour of event A? And that's a great question, right? It is, uh, and it shouldn't because we're pulling out the timestamp. Uh, and that's the timestamp that AIE will use to identify when these things happen. So Simon's real interested in getting your dashboard, your Office 365 dashboard. Uh, and so he'll be the follow-up. You guys can follow up later. Uh, we've got a, a transcript of, of the webinar and, and his email address and so on. Um, yeah, Adam, too. He wants that uh, dashboard shared. So um, All right. It's easy import-export, so I'll be happy to do it. They'll be watching the uh, community, uh, logarithm community, or the support portal. And a bunch of people are saying they want to see it. So you're popular today, Bruce. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, the community is another good place that I can post this. Yeah. Um, if logarithm customers aren't part of that, we did launch a new community uh, a couple months ago uh, on a platform called Lithium. So get onto that, and we're good about getting questions answered there. Um, so if you do have questions about Office 365 or anything else, Logarithm, it's a great resource. If you don't really want to open a support ticket, you just have a quick question. Um, technical product managers are on there, some of the developers, um, and then a lot of our uh, sales and professional services folks that are really knowledgeable about the entire product as well. Awesome. Um, Andrea asks, is Office 365 completely separate from reporting? Uh, so. She's asking about Office 365 reports about which documents are most popular and being downloaded. So yeah, that would be coming, that's usage statistics, I think, Andrea, not part of the auditing. Sammy would like to know, what is the licensing for logarithm? Is it per seat of concurrent users? Is it events per second or what? Uh, there's an events per second. Uh, and if you do have endpoint monitoring, there's some additional licensing there, like if you want uh, real-time FIM for PCI compliance or something, um, but primarily it's a logs per second, but that's averaged across a day, um, and we don't cut you off. So, you know, the worst thing that you could do is uh, be under attack and, you know, let's say you're licensed for 10,000 logs per second, and all of a sudden you spike up to 50, we're not going to cut you off. Uh, we'll just average that out. So if you do have spikes during the day, um, and it comes down at night or comes down after the attack, uh, you won't have to worry about losing data. Nice. Well, I think that takes us to the end of our uh, questions. And uh, folks, we hope this was valuable to you. We'll be sending out a copy of the webinar and the slides and uh, other, follow other follow-up information. What should people do if they'd like to learn more about Logarithm or get a demo or, or whatever like that, uh, Bruce? Uh, you can reach out to me directly, or you can just go to logarithm.com, and we have a section on there. I think it's called Request a Demo or Contact Us, uh, and we'll have somebody in touch right away uh, to figure out you know, what your organization needs are and uh, how we can get a demo set up for your environment. All right. Terrific. Have a great day, everyone, and this won't be the last time we talk about Office 365 and Azure. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye, everybody.